have a an ought a very engaged member of my community who is working in R and D right now, and he presented a ton of great questions for you. But I'm gonna I'm gonna pick two and and ask them okay. before we go into some rapid fire ones. So Jordan asks, do you have any techniques on learning how to be comfortable in uncomfortable learning opportunities? I find that it's easy to get flustered or discombobulated when you're pushing something unknown. It's almost as if your brain wants to make you stop pursuing the unknown and stick to a comfortable routine instead. How can someone effectively learn how to work around this gut feeling? Uh, yeah, no, I, it, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I don't think it ever goes away completely. I think a few things that I've found that help me and seem to help other people when, they, when I've seen them do it is that when I'm about to do something that I don't know how to do, I tell everyone that I'm doing that. Right, because the, one of the one of the obstacles to doing something that you don't know how to do is that you expect everyone else to expect you to know how to do it. Whereas if you bet if you baseline it properly for your other people, it's easier to just not succeed because they know that you're doing something that you don't know how to do yet. The other thing is, what I found is when I tell other people that I don't know how to do something, often I get help. Right, because usually people don't offer help because they think you don't need it. And that they think it's, it'll be patronizing if they offer to help you. But if you tell them, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm about to do something. I don't know exactly how to do it. I hope it works. What you're doing is you're making it okay for people to help you. And that's really useful. Um, the third thing about this kind of gut feeling of not wanting to do this thing that you don't know how to do is it genuinely becomes easier the more you do it. Right. So if what you do is you, your gut tells you don't do this thing that you don't know how to do and you listen to your gut. The next time you do some, the next time you do anything that's even a bit uncertain, you will have exactly the same feeling. But if you do what we were talking about before, and you try this thing out, and you realize even if you fail, it's still not so bad. The next time you confront something that is also uncertain, you're like, you know what? It's kind of uncomfortable, but I'm just going to do it. Because um, your brain then, has I, this I'm gonna, example. I'm plug something. Yeah. What's that? I said your brain has this counter example, right? So it's like. Last time when I felt uncertain and I did something, it it wasn't so bad. And so it's like a vote against, right. you know what I mean? Like this gut, yeah. this gut check. Yeah. And, and I think the more you do that, uh, the more likely it is that at some point you'll realize also that when you did something that you didn't know how to do, you know, when you actually went into uncertainty, most of the time you'll fail. But every so often, if you do it enough, you won't fail. And then that feeling will be amazing. And then you've got not only the counter example that you pointed to that says, oh, you know, gut, you're afraid that it's going to be really bad, but in the past it wasn't so bad. Then you'll have another weapon, which is gut, you're really afraid that it'll be really bad. But actually, not only was it not really bad in the past, there were also some times when it was really good. Sure. And then that's the kind of positive, so that there's going to be a negative reinforcement, right, right. against the gut. And that's important. What you also really want is you want the positive reinforcement because I, I, I'm actually 100% positive that almost every person is like this. We actually love to learn. Mm. We love learning how to do something new. It's just we get tired of all the other shit that you have to do in order to learn new stuff. But when we're just learning something new, we love it, right? And when we learn how to do something and we learn how to do it well, it's one of the best feelings ever. So you only get to learn new things if you do things you don't know how to do. And well, it's that positive reinforcement loop that I think is a really important thing to put yourself into again and again. And that will gradually like not get rid of, but will give you tools to fight against um, that kind of gut reaction that it's a bad thing. Absolutely. What were you going to show me? Um, I actually have a tool which I've been working on for a long time called IDK. And I think one of the things that I was thinking about is we are very much out of practice with putting ourselves in situations where we are uncomfortable, but are also learning. And I'm going to start making tools that will force people to do that of their own accord. Right. So I don't, I don't know when that's going to finally be printed. It's at the printers now, but um, it, it'll, it'll be out soonish. I hope. Good on you. And it's so funny that, because I, I think I heard it, I heard you bring it up in, in Chris's interview that you did with him as well, Chris Spear. Yeah. And uh, it's incredibly validating when what you're working on has these like real world questions that come up where you're like, I need this thing, I need this yeah. thing, and then you're like, oh, that's a, that's a product that I'm working on. Uh, so yeah. I can, I mean, uh, I, 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 us, the whole world's excited for that that deck of cards to come out. 
I'm not sure the whole world is excited. <laughs> I, I'd, be, I'd be very happy if a few people were excited enough. There you by go. It. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So second question from Jordan is a little bit more tactical. That was a little mm-hmm. bit more big picture psychological. Do you notice any commonalities between the R&D chefs and kitchens that you visited in terms of methods of staying organized and productive? I'm curious if there was common practices in place, such as standard formats for recording notes and presenting results to others, tracking progress, record keeping, and efficient communication between team members. Yeah, um, really, really good tactical question. So I think, well... A few things immediately come to mind. One of them is almost all of the good chefs that were R&D chefs took notes aggressively, right? So they, they were not the kind of people who are like, I'm just going to try something out. I'm not going to like note it down. Um, so that's just like default across everyone. But I think this is not unusual. Like lots of, lots of cooks will have the notebook and, and they'll do it. I think what sets them apart is how almost instinctive it was to make note of even what appeared to be really trivial details, because in the end, what will make the difference between success and failure is a trivial detail. So that's one thing. Um, In terms of what they did that made them effective, I think that we need to separate between people who are experienced R&D chefs and people who are learning to become experienced R&D chefs. Experienced R&D chefs, I I don't know if you've ever had this experience or whether your listeners have ever had this experience where you try and do something and a very experienced chef who is guiding you doesn't just tell you what whether or not you succeeded, but tells you how to succeed. Like, this was bad. You should do it this way instead. So I know it sounds like that's the right way to do it, but for an R&D chef, it's actually the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to say, this did not work the way it needs to work and I want you to do it differently so that it does the following thing, right? Not this is how you change it. It's that I want you to achieve, you got the wrong outcome. I'm going to tell you what the correct outcome is. You go figure out how to get to that correct outcome. So it's a really subtle difference. But if you think back or if your listeners think back to all the times when you really learned how to do something well, It wasn't because someone told you exactly what to do. It's that they told you how to know when you were successful so that you can then go off and figure out what you needed to do based on all the ingredients or limitations that you're facing to get to that definition of success. And so the really good R&D chefs who are senior are good at not at resisting telling people how to do things and at getting very good at explaining what the desired result is. And in this way, they're actually very similar to very good military commanders, Mm. right? Because what really good military commanders do is they realize if you're in a battlefield, you cannot simply say to all of your men, I want you to do the following, you know, 55 thing list of things because you can't predict what's going to happen. What you can do is you can tell them, this is the end result I want. Use your discretion and go get get me this result, right? They, They call it command intent. Um, or, or in German, it's like Aufragstaktik. Um, and it's something which experienced and and psychologically and emotionally secure commanders will do. And that's also what these experienced R&D chefs who are good will do. Now, what do good learning R&D chefs do? I think what's really interesting is really good R&D chefs who are developing into that space are really, really good at saying when they don't know something because... And, and, and th- I think this is also very counterintuitive and not just in the world of cooking. It's just counterintuitive everywhere because if you're a junior and you're trying to show that you're good, you always think the only way to show that I'm good is to not show that I don't know, right? Display and the competence. really good ones are always like, I have no idea what's going on. Help me learn, right? And it, it sounds really cliched and hackneyed, but it is genuinely true. They will not pretend that they know how to do something when they don't. They will be very, very open about not knowing something because again, what it does is it encourages people to trust you more because when you say you know how to do something, you probably can be believed. And it encourages them to help you learn. And that's really what you want. Yeah. So anyway. Seth Godin has this rant that he goes on where he talks about spec, doing things to spec. And I think the thing that often gets missed prior to that is like, you have to define the spec. 
You know what I mean? When, when right. the spec is not defined, it's easy to say, oh, we'll just go off and do it better. You didn't do this right. But mm-hmm. if the work gets done prior to that, where it, the the juice from the peas needs to be bright green and seasoned in this way and whatever, Correct. that's the spec, yeah. you know? So then it's like, then yeah. you can, you know, do these little kind of like optimization tweaks to make it a more efficient process or to set up your station a little yeah. bit better or whatever. But if the spec is missing, it can be incredibly yeah. frustrating. And and I think the problem with the problem that all R and D chefs will face is that by definition, if you are coming up with something new, there is no spec, right? And so, and, and I think this is where this idea of by the way, this is where style comes back in, right? Because the really good R and D chefs are able to talk about when something is successful, even if there is not yet an exemplar of what that success is. Right. Right. So how do you know if you are the R and D chef at I don't know the Fat Duck? that something is a fat ducky dish if the dish doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. The really good senior R&D chefs are able to communicate that successful outcome to the people on their team so that they get there. It's incredibly hard. This is why not all restaurants in the world are great, right? Very few of them are are truly great. It's It's really tough.